learn the basics of using Linux. Josh teaches this course for absolute beginners, and he will help you get a full understanding of how the Linux operating system works. Hello everyone, my name is Josh from Keep It Techie, and welcome to my introduction to Linux course. The purpose of this course is to help you get a full overview of what the Linux operating system is and how it is used in everyday life. I noticed there was a need for a basic course for people interested in getting into the IT field. Now Linux is used in pretty much all aspects of the field. For example, Linux is used in the cloud. It's also used in the cybersecurity field, especially when you're looking at pen testing. So I created this course so you can at least get the basics of using the Linux operating system. Now, a quick disclaimer, if you're looking for a more advanced course for, let's say, a Linux certification, then this may have some information that can help you, but it will not cover all the topics needed in order to pass a certification exam. And just to give you an overview, I will only cover basic topics such as installation, basic configuration, terminal usage, understanding the file system, as well as software management. So please remember this course is designed for people that are very new to the Linux operating system. I have a course that hasn't been fully completed that will be released in the near future which will cover all modules that are needed for the CompTIA Linux Plus exam. So once that's uploaded, you can easily roll from this course into the next course in order to take the CompTIA Linux Plus exam. Now let's start off by giving you a little bit about myself. I have been an IT professional since 2007. I've worked in multiple positions, some of which a network administrator, systems administrator, and I'm currently working as a database administrator. And I've also been a Linux user since the year of 2008. So I have a lot of knowledge when it comes to working with the Linux operating system. Now, what is Linux? When most people ask this question, the response that's given is simply Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, or maybe Arch Linux. But these are what is called Linux distributions. And Linux is basically the kernel of those Linux distributions combined with other software such as GNU software and other pre-installed software. Now, just to break down everything that's combined to create a distribution, we have to look at some of the creators of each separate port. And the first one I need to cover is Richard Stallman. And in the 80s, uh, many companies started developing their own Unix operating system. For instance, IBM, uh, Sun, and HP, they all had different versions of the Unix operating system that they were developing. And the results was a mass of Unix dialects and a dozen different ways to do the same thing. And so this is where Richard Stallman came in to end the era of Unix separation and prevent people from reinventing the wheel by starting the GNU project. And GNU simply means GNU is not Unix. And his goal was to make an operating system that was freely available to everyone and where everyone could work together. And many of the command line tools that are in modern day Linux use the GNU tools that was created under this organization by Richard Stallman. And just to give you a little bit more about his background, he's an American free software movement activist, also a programmer that went to MIT. And he also created the organization called Free Software Foundation. And he's an avid campaigner for software to be distributed in a manner such that its users receive the freedom to use, study, distribute, and modify that software. So now this rolls right into the next question, which is what is the Linux kernel? And the Linux kernel is a free and open source monolithic module multitasking Unix like operating system kernel. And the kernel is simply a program that talks directly to the hardware 
and manages the resources and processes. And the meaning behind Linux is Linux is not Unix. And to cover the creator, uh, the Linux kernel was actually created by a guy named Linus Torvalds. And after its creation, it was soon adopted as the kernel for the GNU operating system. And it became a free replacement for Unix. And since that combination of these two projects, it has spawned a large number of operating system distributions. And they're pretty much all commonly called Linux. Now that we understand the GNU project as well as the Linux kernel, let's go ahead on and cover a Linux distribution. Now there are many Linux distributions. But simply put, a Linux distribution is a complete Linux system package. And many Linux distributions are available to meet just about any computing requirements you could have. And most distributions are customized for a specific user group, such as a business user, a multimedia enthusiast, software developers, and your average home user. And as you can see on the screen, this is four major Linux distributions that are out there. One is Ubuntu, Debian, and then Kali Linux, as well as Red Hat. And just to explain each one of them, Ubuntu and Debian are one of your basic desktop Linux distributions that you can use. And we all know Ubuntu is the most popular distribution in the world. And I threw Kali Linux up there because this is the most used distribution when it comes to cybersecurity, as well as the hacker culture. And Red Hat covers the business side because this distribution is not 100% free. And the way they charge as far as the model for Red Hat is that businesses pay for the support. But as stated, there are a whole bunch of Linux distributions that will meet most of your needs. And now let's cover the course distribution, which is the distribution I'll use throughout this course, which is Ubuntu. And we know that it's Debian based and it is composed mostly of free and open source software. And Ubuntu is released in three different editions. They have a desktop edition, a server edition, and a core edition, which is typically used for Internet of Things devices, as well as robots. And all the editions can run on the computer alone or in a virtual machine, which is why I chose Ubuntu for this course, because I want you guys to kind of follow along no matter the hardware that you are working with. Now, let's go on and get started. Now, as I stated in the previous segment, we will be using Ubuntu for the full course. So I will now cover how to actually download it and install the distribution. And I'm currently at Ubuntu.org. This is the simplest way to actually get the Ubuntu distribution. If you hover up to the top where it says downloads, click the down arrow that will get you the Ubuntu desktop. And the current version right now is 20.04. And I always recommend people use the LTS, which stands for long-term support. This release has the longest support time versus any of the others. Now you can also install the Ubuntu server version, but it doesn't have a desktop environment. And like I stated, stated earlier, there is a Ubuntu core or Ubuntu for IoT that you can actually download for your mini boards like a Raspberry Pi. Now, in order to download it, all you have to do is click on D20.04 and that will start the download. And it only takes a couple minutes depending on your internet speed. But you wanna go down and download this and then I'll be back once it's finished to go through the install with you guys. So now that we have Ubuntu downloaded, I just wanted to talk about the couple ways that you can install Ubuntu. Now there's the direct way. There's also a way to install it in a virtual machine, as well as you can install it within the cloud. 
But most of the times people install the server edition in the cloud because they may want to set up a web server or something to that effect. Now you can install it directly to your hard drive, but I definitely don't recommend you do this for this course unless you have a secondary computer. Because when you install it directly on your system, you have to make sure you have a backup of all your files. And since we're just going through a course and a simple introduction, I don't want people to go through this and mess up their computer by not having backups, lose files, and don't have a way to recover them. And then also when it comes to a direct install, you have to write the ISO to a USB or a CD, which will cause a little bit more confusion than necessary just to go through and follow and run a couple commands that I'll teach you through this course. So the main way I want to show you guys how to install Ubuntu is by using an application called VirtualBox. Now, Oracle VirtualBox is a type two hypervisor and also VirtualBox can be installed on all three major platforms, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And then also when you use VirtualBox, you have the opportunity to try the operating system before you actually commit to installing it directly on your hardware. And then also one thing about VirtualBox, you have to have newer hardware because the newer the hardware you have, the more likely that virtualization is supported through your processor. And since this is 2022, I know a lot of people are using newer laptops and virtualization is turned on by default. And I wanted to make sure I open this up to as many people as possible so they can go through the training successfully. Now let's hop over to my desktop so we can walk through installing Ubuntu within VirtualBox. Okay, so our ISO is downloaded and I have it stored in a folder, but this is what I actually downloaded right here, which is what you will receive when you hit the download button from Ubuntu. So you wanna make sure you find that location so you can create the virtual machine. Now this is VirtualBox Manager. And it's a very simple application to use. It looks and feels the exact same way on all different platforms. So Windows, Mac OS, as well as Linux, it looks pretty much the same. And most likely when you first open this application, there won't be anything there. And I currently have some virtual machines already here. That's why they're listed. Now, in order to create our virtual machine, all you have to do is hit new. So we can hit new and then what you want to do is name the operating system. Now, I know this is a Ubuntu system, so I'm, I'm going to just put Ubuntu as the name. And you can also put the version number. I, sometimes I put 20.04 at the end of it, and I'll do that for the, the purposes of this video so you guys can follow along with it. Now, you want to select the type. Now, it'll automatically kind of recognize based on whatever you type up here, and it automatically pulled up Ubuntu down here, as well as the type, which is Linux. And if we click under here, I just wanted to show you guys the different options. But you have Microsoft Windows, Solaris, uh, BSD, IBM, Mac OS X, and other. And what you want to do is make sure it selects Linux. Most of the time, like I said, when you type in the operating system, it'll automatically update here with the right information and Ubuntu 64 bit. And as you can see, when you click under type, it'll open and expand the different versions. And what you want to do is make sure it's on Ubuntu 64 bits. And so we're good there. We can hit next. And now this is your memory size. Now this is all dependent on the extra resources that you have on your system. Now my laptop has 16 gigabytes of memory. So I have some to spare. And for this demonstration, I'll just select eight since I have the resources to spare, but you may wanna select like four or six when it comes to this, depending on how much memory you have on the system. Now Ubuntu can actually run with less memory depending on the desktop environment. Like for instance, if you're using the XFCE version of Ubuntu, then you can probably get away with two gigabytes of memory, but I always recommend for people starting out, just give it four 
gigabytes of memory, and you'll be good to go. So let's hit next there. Now we have to select our hard drive. And this is just a way to select if you already have a hard drive created. And what this is, is a virtual hard drive. It doesn't really exist. It's kind of like a container, so to speak. And I'm only using that as an example. It's not the actual application that runs containers like Docker, but it's essentially a containerized file that's virtual, that's used by the virtual machine where all your files will be stored. And it's looked at by the operating system as a real hard drive, but it's actually not, it's just created by VirtualBox itself. So what you wanna verify is that you wanna create a virtual hard disk now. So you can hit create there. And there are different types of hard disks within this application. There's the VDI, which is a virtual box disk image, VHD, which is virtual hard disk, and VMDK, which is a virtual machine disk. And I know that's kind of confusing, but some of these is basically the format of the type of virtualized hard disk that will be used for this operating system. And the main thing that needs to be explained, the difference is there are other types of hypervisors out there that use a different format. For for instance, I believe VHD is the one used by VMware, but we're not going to worry about that. We'll just use the virtual box disk image for this demonstration. So let's hit next there. Now, this is an important step that I always try to tell people when I'm teaching them how to use VirtualBox. There are two different ways of storing the data within the hard disk. There is dynamically all allocated and a fixed size. Now, dynamically allocated means that the, the hard drive will only be as big as the actual fi files. And as you add more and more files to it, it will grow. Now, with a fixed size, if you select a hard drive of 10 gigabytes, then it will take up 10 gigabytes of space on your system. So I always tell people to use dynamically allocated. That way it'll grow as you need it. It won't take up, take away from the resources from your main machine. So let's hit next there. And as you can see, it will store the virtual machine in a location. I won't go too deep into that, but that's basically where the virtual machine is stored or the hard drive itself. And then also the size, you can set the size as 10 gigs, or you can go even higher, depending on how many, re how much resources you have in your system. For instance, I have a two terabyte hard drive within my laptop where this is located. So that's why it's showing two terabytes, but you can't use the full two terabytes because like I said, this is running on a operating system that's already installed. So if you don't have two terabytes, which I'm sure I don't because of all the files and folders and applications that I have installed on this system, I definitely don't have that space to give to this virtual machine. Now you don't have to really worry about it if you select it dynamically allocated because it will only grow to the size that it needs for the operating system and whatever files that you put on the virtual machine. But I always recommend people use like 10 gigabytes for just a install that you're doing for testing purposes. But let's go down and hit create and that will conclude the setup. And that was basically the initial configuration of the virtual machine. We have to go into the settings and make a few more changes before we actually launch the virtual machine. So let's hit settings and you wanna make sure that that virtual machine is selected. That way it'll open up the settings for that virtual machine. And we don't have to mess with anything under general, but I'll go through and show you at least the tabs. Now there is a shared clipboard, drive and drag and drop you could turn that on which i won't need that for this demonstration uh you could write a description in there and then they also allow you to create this encryption if you want to i recommend you don't do that especially if you don't have especially if this virtual machine is just temporary and you're probably going to delete it in the future now if we go to the next tab that's the system you can make changes to how you set up the virtual motherboard for instance that's the base memory and like i said i gave it eight gigabytes of memory but you can select it whatever you can make changes there if you need to 
And then also it has a virtualized boot order. So, you know, like when you boot up a physical computer, it'll pop up with hitting either like F12 or F9 to select a different boot order or select something to boot first within the order from the BIOS, then you can make those changes here as well. And then some chipset information, uh, you can enable EFI for special, you know, OSs if you need it. I don't recommend you select it. You can just use the default. Now under processing, you can give your virtual machine more processors, which I'll bump mine up to two. Now I have a whole bunch of cores on my system because I'm using a Ryzen on my laptop. So you select what's best for you, but two cores is just enough for what I'm trying to do with this virtual machine as far as just showing you guys how it all works. And then there is an acceleration tab, which we will leave default. Now under display, what I typically do is bump up the video memory uh, to 128 and then enable 3D acceleration. And then there are some other tabs in here, remote display and recording if you need to. Uh, and then storage. This is where you want to add your ISO. So right now it's a virtualized IDE controller, which is the CD drive. And all you have to do is and select over here where the little disk is. And you can find the ISO by clicking choose a disk file. And then all you have to do is go on your system now and find that ISO that we downloaded from Ubuntu a few seconds ago. And once you find that ISO, you just select it and that will actually add it to the virtualized CD drive. And then as you can see right here, this is the hard drive that we created, the 10 gigabyte hard drive. And that is where the operating system will be installed. But this is needed in order to boot up the operating system in order to install it. And I just wanted to explain that for people that are very, very new so you can understand exactly what we're doing and this is similar to installing it on physical hardware meaning that this iso would typically be written to a cd or a usb drive and you're basically plugging it in to your hard drive and then your hard drive is booting this cd and then writing to your physical hard drive that's within your laptop now, the rest of these options I won't go through, uh, but it's basically the audio network settings. Now, one thing you can actually change right here, uh, which I didn't think about talking about, but they do have different types of networks you can set up like NAT, which it'll basically use your IP address for this machine. And then they have bridge adapter, internal network, uh, host only, which I'll just leave it on NAT so we can have internet for this virtual machine. And then also serial ports, USB ports, which I kind of leave most of this stuff off or I turn it off, but you could just leave it the defaults. Now let's go down and press OK. And that's pretty much saved our settings for the virtual machine. And we can basically boot it up and start the install. So it's two ways to actually start it. You can double click on the actual virtual machine or you can hit this down arrow or you could just hit start, but they do have options under here. They have a normal start, they have a headless start and a detached start. And what you wanna use is the normal start or just double click on a virtual machine and it'll start it up. And as you can see, it's popping up. It has our boot, you know, order. It automatically recognized the CD drive that we had in the actual system. And then one thing with Ubuntu, it'll go through and check your files before it opens up the installer. Now, one thing that Ubuntu will do, it'll pop up with a installer right away as soon as it boots into the operating system. And there are two options. First thing you wanna do is select your language. So if you're in a different country, you can select whatever language that applies to you. But since I'm in the US, I'm gonna select US or English. But the two options are you can try Ubuntu or you can install Ubuntu, and which is what we want to do. Uh, we're going to install Ubuntu, but you can actually try the operating system before you actually do the install. And this is beneficial if you're installing directly on your hardware, because every now and then you'll run into a system that is not 100% supported. 
but this is very rare but i try to tell people to use the try ubuntu first that way it'll verify that your system will actually run the ubuntu operating system without any issues and it basically boots up the system as if it's on installed on the actual computer with all the applications and everything you want to do in order to use the operating system you can get on the internet you can play around with files you could do pretty much anything you can do if it was physically installed on your hardware now the only thing is if you download files or in install something or whatever it's gonna reset if you reboot the system so it won't save anything which that's basically called persistence now let's go through the installer by just hitting install ubuntu which is what i want you guys to do if you're going through this course now the first thing that'll pop up is the keyboard lay layout so you select whatever keyboard layout applies to you but since i'm in the u.s uh, English US and then English US over here and then you can also test the keyboard just to make sure that all the keys line up and all that stuff so let's hit continue and so it says right here what apps would you like to install to start up you could do the normal installation now they do have a minimal installation it'll come with a web browser and basic utilities but I'll install the normal version so you can see all the software that's on it and then the updates right here it'll download updates while installing Ubuntu because these packages or ISOs that are created are not always up to date like they'll update the ISO let's say once a month or a couple months depending on the developers of the actual distribution so sometimes you'll download an ISO and it's a couple weeks behind the update. So this will verify that you have a up-to-date machine as soon as you boot up the operating system and the installation is complete. So I'll just hit continue there. I'm going to just leave the defaults. Now, this is a very important step. This is where you want to install the operating system, meaning the hard drive. And one thing it says right there, warning. This will delete all your programs, documents, folders, photos, music, and any other files on any other operating system that's on the hard drive. So if you're installing this on physical hardware, you want to make sure you have backups of all your files because when you run through this installation and you get to this step, this lets you know that it's going to erase the hard drive and you will lose everything on the system. We don't have to worry about that because we elected to install it all on VirtualBox. So this is an empty hard drive or a virtual hard disk with nothing on it. So we don't have to worry about it, but they do have options for you to set up the hard drive in your own configuration, which I won't go through. That's pretty much advanced. Uh, if you're just installing this to follow along with the class, then I recommend you select just erase this and install Ubuntu. And we could just click install now and it'll go through the install. And I actually forgot about this next step. The next step is going to ask you where you're located. Uh, I'm on the West Coast, so I select Los Angeles, which is super cool. And then also you have to select and create a user account. And this is something that most Linux distributions want you to do. They want you to create a user account and not use the root account, which I'll talk about later on in the course. And I'll change the computer name to Ubuntu 20. And then what you want to do is select a password or create a password. And so I'll throw that in there. And just to throw you guys a little bit more information, uh, one thing they do have two options when it comes to logging in. You can log in automatically or you can require a password to log in, which I always recommend people use a password. And then with Ubuntu, they also have it to where you can connect to Active Directory. So if you understand uh, Windows and Active Directory, you can add this system to Active Directory, which is a little bit outside of the, the scope of this course. So let's move on. Hit continue. And like I said, it's going through the install and it actually doesn't take too long, but I'll be back when it actually complete, completes. And so since the installation is complete, this will pop up for you. It'll basically say installation complete. You need to restart the computer in order to use the new installation. So all you have to do is hit restart. And this concludes the installation portion of Ubuntu for the course. 
Okay, so our installation is complete, and this is the desktop that you'll see when you log into your Ubuntu 20.04. Now, I won't spend too much time on the desktop environment. I'll just basically do an overview of how to actually use the Linux desktop. And then we'll dive into the terminal, which is where all the magic happens when it comes to the Linux operating system. So let's start off by uh, giving you guys a overview of how the desktop works and how to use it. And if you're coming from Windows or Mac OS, then this shouldn't be too difficult for you to pick up on. As you can see, it has a main bar at the top, which has all your tasks and hardware, hardware changes. Like for instance, uh, the sound settings right here. Right here is the log out button or shut down button. So you can click there and that'll bring that up and you can shut down the system. You can also modify your internet connection. You know, the simple things that you would see in a Windows taskbar or the taskbar on a Mac OS system. And then right here in the center, you'll see you have the date and time. And if you click on it, there is a calendar. And then also you'll receive notifications here, which is super cool to see. Now, if we go over here to the left on this actual taskbar, you'll see where it says activities. You can click there and that'll actually open up any processes that are going on on the system or applications that may be running and minimized on the system. Like currently, I'm running some updates on this installation. And I'll get into that later, how to actually do updates on the system using the graphical user interface. And if we click on that, that'll hide it back where it was. And as you can see on the desktop, you have folders. So this is the home directory, which is what they call it on a Linux system, the home directory. This is where all your files and folders are stored. And I wanted to cover this so you guys can at least see that the files that we are going to create and manipulate using the terminal once we get to that point can be modified using the GUI as well. And it looks different, you know what I'm saying? It's different from your Windows operating system as well as the Mac OS operating system. It's different, but the concept is pretty much the same. Uh, you can double click on folders and they'll open them up. You, they, are have, they have a back button so you can go back and you can navigate throughout the file system as needed. Now, let me go down and close this because I want to show you guys they do have a trash can. So if you delete something, it'll throw it in the trash can. And that opened up our file explorer again, which is another way to actually get to it. So let's go down and close that again. By default, you have a lot of software installed, especially on this version of Ubuntu. When we went through the install, it installed pretty much the default software that anyone would need or what they think anyone will need to use the operating system to its full potential. And just to cover some of it, if we go on the left hand side, you'll see this taskbar on the left hand side. This shows you your favorite software that's on there. And as you can see, we have Firefox. So our web browser, uh, Thunderbird is a mail client similar to Microsoft Outlook. You also, that's the same file explorer. Like when we clicked on Josh, that'll open up the file explorer and I'll open it up again, just so you guys can see. This is a music player. And like I said, I won't go through all this software. I just kind of want to show you what's there by default so you can understand that pretty much everything on this system is installed to make the transition from one of these other operating systems a whole lot easier. And like I stated, this is a music player. Then we have... Uh, this is similar to Microsoft Word. Now, one thing I want to show you guys was the software center. So I'll go down and open that up. But this is how you get other software. And just so you guys can get a full understanding, Linux doesn't have the typical software that you would install on a Windows operating system or Mac OS. It has its own repositories or locations where certain free and open source software is located so you can install it and use it on the operating system and a lot of these applications are made to be a one com one to one comparison 
with software that you would see on other operating systems. Like earlier, what I was talking about, this is equivalent to Microsoft Word. Well, you can actually write documents just like Microsoft Word. You can even store the files in the Microsoft Word format. So you can jump back and forth with a particular file and you can easily modify it on your Windows system if you want to. So I just kind of wanted to cover that, but as you can see, this is the software. You can look at the Explorer. They have the editor's pick, so you can go through, play around, and install some of the software. Uh, there are different categories, so you can go through and look at all this different software. And then also, you can check out what's actually installed on the system. And this right here is makes it very simple for new users to Linux to actually transition over because it's not that difficult to install. Because once you find something under the Explorer list, let's say you wanna install Signal or GIMP, all you have to do is open up the actual application or click on it, and then there's the install button, and it'll install it on your system. So let's go back, and I just wanted to show you guys, this is where you update your system as well, but I'll show you the proper Linux way of updating things once we get to the command line portion, but I at least wanted you guys to see it here. But this is where you can update all your applications that are installed on the system. Now, let's go down and close that because I want to show you guys they do have a help guide. So if you need help with while using this operating system, that will open up the how to guide basically goes through the overview of using the system. And I really wanted to show you guys this because I know a lot of people that are taking this course or are new to the Linux operating system. This is a great place to get help. And that's why I use Ubuntu because the community, all the documentation and pretty much everything is, is out there for you to use so you can fully understand how to use the desktop environment as well as Linux in general. Now let's go down and close that. But like I said, this is the software updater that actually popped up and it's telling me to restart now, but I'm not going to restart at the moment. Let's minimize this because I want to show you guys a few other things. And right here, this is basically the installation ISO. I kind of left it on this system, but most of the time you want to remove it or you want to remove it from the actual system. If you're doing a physical install, if you did it on a, using a USB drive or a CD drive, you want to remove that CD or remove the USB drive from the computer. That way you'll, you can verify that it's booting from the hard drive, especially if you made changes within the BIOS as far as the boot order. So it won't keep looping and going back into the installer versus booting from the hard drive. Now I wanted to show you guys how to actually get to all the software that's installed on the system. As you can see, this is just basically what's open as well as the favorited software. But if you click here under show applications, it'll pop up with a screen and this looks fairly similar to people that use Android phones. You know how you swipe up and that'll bring up all your applications. That's ex exactly what this looks like. But this is for a full blown system and not a phone. But you can access all your software from here. Uh, I won't go through them all. I just kind of wanted to show you that's how you actually get to it if you need to use any of the software on the system. And one area I wanted to show you guys before we move on to the next session is the settings. Now, this is where you want to go if you need to make changes to this system in general. Pretty much all your settings are in this one location. Uh, like you have your network settings, Bluetooth settings. If you have a Bluetooth, Bluetooth hardware on your system, uh, the background, you can change the appearance, notifications, uh, applications. You can set your default applications in here, uh, privacy settings. So you're not being tracked by any type of software or the operating system itself. You can also log into online accounts if you want to. For instance, they have a way to connect to your Google account. That way your email and all that stuff will be connected directly to your Google account, which is which is very beneficial. And then also sharing, you can set up like share drives. They also have sound, power settings, display settings. And like I said, any 
type of settings that you could think of or under here. Uh, if you have a printer at home that you want to set up to it, you can install your print drivers under here. As you can see, Ubuntu is real good with this. It picks up the printers on your network. I have a brother's printer as well as a HP desktop jet printer that's on my network currently and it already picked those up and added them to the actual desktop. And then also, this is something I was gonna get to within the command line, but I wanted to show you that you can do a lot of this stuff that I'm gonna do in the command line from the GUI. But as I stated, the power of Linux is within the command line, but you can modify user accounts as well, which is super cool to actually have access to from a GUI. Now let's go down and close this, and this will conclude the portion of the basic understanding of how to use a Linux desktop environment. Now a quick note, depending on what distribution you use, the desktop environment may look totally different from what I'm showing you here. But if you're following along with this course and you install Ubuntu, your desktop environment should look similar to what mine is showing here. But I just want to at least let you guys know that in the future, once you start playing around with other distributions, the desktop environment may look a little different. Certain things may, in different, may be in different places, but the overall concepts are pretty much the same. And that's why it's important for you guys to understand how to use the terminal because a lot of the tools and a lot of the software that you use within the terminal is used across all Linux distributions. So let's hop over to the next section. And now we'll be covering how to actually use the terminal. And the first thing I want to do is just basically show some of the configurations for the terminal once we get it up open and basically what is called the terminal emulator. And you could just search for it under your applications. You'll see it pop up. You can actually just search up here at the top type terminal and that'll bring up the actual terminal emulator. And as you can see, it should kind of remind you of those old hacker movies where someone is just typing at the terminal. That's essentially what this is. It's just the terminal emulator. It's an application that affords you to interact with the OS using commands. And one of the first things that'll pop up, which you can kind of ignore, but it talks about sudo. And I'll cover that a little bit later on in the demonstration where that actual application can help you while running certain commands. Now, before we type anything, I just wanted to show you guys some of the configurations that you have for the terminal emulator. And this is similar to any application. I could show you the settings, the how to make it look a little different, you know, using the options that are in it. So if, if you click right here, this will open up the menu and you can just click preferences down here and this will open up all your preferences for the terminal emulator. As you can see, they have a help button up here that'll open up some information about how to actually use it, but I'll walk you guys through it. Uh, this is the generals tab and this has just basic information on the looks of it. Like there's a theme, you could change the theme to dork. Uh, you can open new terminals in a new window, or you can open it as a tab, which is beneficial, especially if you're working with different systems because you can connect to other Linux operating systems via the terminal and you could tab back and forth using those tabs. So it's super cool. But if you have tabs enabled up here, this is kind of where it'll, it'll help you if you have tabs turned on right here. So anytime you open up a new terminal, it'll open up as a tab. Then you can specify the position that you want it to pop up in once it opens up. So last and then next is the, the other option. Now, next thing on here, I wanted to show you guys these shortcuts. This is something that I think you should definitely check out. I'm not gonna go through all these shortcuts, but there are plenty of shortcuts to help you while using the terminal. And then also you have a profile and currently right now, this is the profile uh, for us. It's unnamed. You can actually go in and name it if you want to. I'm not gonna name it. I'm gonna just leave it the way it is. But this profile is tied to your user account. So if you log out, log back in, whatever you set, within this profile tab, 
of unnamed will stay the same each and every time you log into the system. But as you can see, you have a whole bunch of options here. This is how you modify the terminal to make it look a little different. Uh, there are some text appearance. Uh, you can set fonts. You can set the spacing. Um, as far as the cursor that you see that's blinking right here, uh, you can modify that by making changes. You can change it from block to an eye beam. And I'll just go down and do it so you guys can see. It should change it. Yeah, as you can see, the eye beam is just a line. Uh, you can also, you know, change it to an underline, like an underscore, pretty much, and it blinks. And then you can also change that to where it doesn't blink. I like the blocks. Uh, I'll leave that as default, but you can turn it off where it doesn't blink like it's blinking right now. Should be blinking right now. Yeah. And then right here, they do have sounds for the terminal. I don't, I never really mess with any of this stuff. I may change the colors, which is some of, which is on the next tab. And under here, you have built in themes. So you can modify this if you want to. Currently, it's set to use the system theme, but you can easily modify that by unchecking this box. And you can modify it using a theme that's already there. Or you can create your own custom theme by selecting different colors. Uh, like there's a text color, background color, a bold color, cursor colors and highlight colors and then also they have it where you can set transparency on the background which is super cool i like that uh and currently it's set to use the transparency from the system theme so a lot of people will just use the default which is no problem with it but once you start getting good and familiar with using the terminal and different applications and linux in general then you can start customizing and modifying the system as you see fit but there are down below a lot of color palettes so you can go through and select whatever you want and make the terminal look however you want it now as far as scrolling a lot of times i leave this as default but this is basically if you're running a whole bunch of uh commands or something and you want to uh, see what actually happened the screen will scroll down as you're running commands especially if it's a command that looks at let's say a lot of files or something then it's just gonna scroll past everything. And if there's an error, then you may want to scroll up and look at it. So I leave that as default, but you can scroll back and forth, up and down throughout all the commands that you've ran, as well as the results that come through from the command that you actually ran. Now, under here, there are commands. So you can run a specific command on login and custom commands if you want to. And then also preserve working directory for the shell only. That's that's just another option right there. And then when command exit, exit the terminal, you can, you can set that up. Um, I don't recommend you do that. Just leave the defaults. You should be fine. And then also un, under compatibility, there are some changes there, but we won't mess it that, with that at all. Now let's go down and close the preferences. And one thing I want us to do is actually zoom in so you guys can see a little bit better because it's it's difficult to see things within the terminal unless you make it a little big especially raw recording as you guys know i'm recording this in a virtual machine so it's kind of difficult to record where you guys can see everything without blowing it up so hopefully you guys can see this but this is what you'll be greeted with when you first open up the terminal and it's only showing this right here because this is our first time running it on this system all together. And just to break things down, the first thing that will show up is your user account. So we know that when we install this operating system, I set up a user account as Josh, which is my name. So it'll show whatever your name is or whatever you set during the installation and then there's a at symbol so it's similar to an email address look at it that way you have the at symbol and then after that is the system name so this is what we actually named the operating system when we went through the install and then after this colon that basically explains or shows you where you are that's what this tilde is for and currently we are in the home directory and then after this, this is where you actually type the command. So you could just type right in there and that's where you actually run your commands. 
And the first command that I'm finna show you is the most important command that you will learn using the terminal. And that command is man. And man basically stands for manual. And this is something that you will, I will use with every command that I show you guys that we run within a terminal. Man basically gives you information about whatever command you're trying to run within the Linux terminal. And let me give you an example. The first example I will show you of a command and showing you the manual is man space man. Now that is the manual for the man command. So essentially, whenever you run the man command, whatever you're looking for or whatever manual you're looking for, you have to put that command behind it. So there are other commands like CD. You can put CD behind man and that will open up the manual for the CD command. But like I said, we want to look at the manual for the man command. So it's man space man and press enter and you'll see it'll pop up with the actual man, the manual for man. And as you can see right here, just kind of break it down. This shows you the actual command. Then it says manual page utility for the utility man. And then it gives you a name, a synopsis, basically how to use the command and a description of everything about that command. And it does the exact same thing for most of the other commands within the Linux operating system. And let's just read the name right fast. So man, an interface to the system reference manuals. Now, at the end of the day, there's basically a small database running on the system that hosts all the manuals for all the different commands. And you can use the man command to pull up those manuals. And they'll show up in the terminal just like this. And in order to navigate, all you have to do is use your up and down arrows. And that'll move up and down throughout the terminal of the manual. And as I was saying, there is a synopsis, so it kind of shows you some of the options because a lot of commands, they also have options that allows you to modify the results of the commands. So just to break down the first one, it says man, option, section, page, etc. So you can modify the result results that will come out while running that actual command. And then this breaks down the description. And like I said, this is in every manual for every command that's on the operating system. And the information here is very beneficial uh, when you're first learning how to use this. And in certain cases, there are examples of how to actually use the command. So you can check these out. They explain what they're actually doing while using the option. And you can test some of these examples as well by running them on your own. And the way you get out of these manuals is simply by looking at the bottom where it says press H for help or Q for quit. So all you have to do is hit the Q button and that will actually exit you out of that command. So congratulations, that's the first command you have ran within the Linux terminal. And as you can see, it's super simple. But I wanna highlight again, man is very important especially when you're first starting out using the Linux terminal, because there's no way in the world that you can remember all these different commands and how to use every single option within it. So if you're trying to figure something out using a command that you've never touched before or a command that you haven't touched in a long time, then the man command is definitely beneficial. Now that you guys have a full understanding of the man command, now I want to show you guys how to actually work with directories within the shell. Now I showed you guys earlier that you can navigate the shell by simply opening up the file explorer and going through and just looking, you know, at your documents or your different folders that you have where, well, there is a way to do this within the terminal. And I'll show you guys a couple commands that can help you work within different directories. And the first command I want to show you guys is the PWD command. 
So we're going to use that man command again, and I'll use that for every command that I run. So you guys can actually see that the man command does help you while understanding commands. So let's type man and then PWD and press enter. And that'll open up the manual for PWD. And as you can see, the name of it is PWD and print name of current working directory. And this is an important command because when you're navigating through files and folders on the Linux operating system, you can easily lose track of the location that you're at. And this command is important because it'll allow you to just simply write this command and it'll show you the location that you at. Now let's press Q for quit and let's go down and run this command now. And let's type PWD and this is actually running the command and we can press enter and that'll show you the working directory. And remember when I brought up the tilde represents the home directory. Well, everybody's home directory or all users on the operating system will have a folder under the home directory, which is just a folder on the file system and it'll be named after your username. So let's click here under files and I wanted to show you guys the location of this. So you can see a GUI representation of it as well. So and from what it looks like, I have to go under other locations and that'll bring up computer. Uh, and that's basically what I wanted to show you guys. So we click on computer. This is the root directory, which is the represented by the forward slash right there. And then what we're looking for is the home directory. So that's that home directory and then the Josh directory. So that's essentially the same location as the home location right here. You just don't see it. They kind of hide it from you, but it is there. And that's one of the powers of using a terminal. You can see the exact location where you are. And this goes into absolute path versus relative path which I'll give you a quick overview of what that is. An absolute path is the full location to a file or a folder or a directory. So home and Josh. And then a relative path is an assumed path, which I'll cover a little bit more once we get to the CD command, which is the next one. Now let's open up the CD man page. So all we have to do is type man, and then CD and basically CD stands for change directory. And as you can see, certain commands don't have a manual, especially if it's a very old command. And I wanted to do this on purpose so you guys can see that some commands you may run into won't have a manual, but majority of them do. When it comes to the CD command it's so old and it's been around forever that they assume that most people know, understand what it actually means. But the CD command is simply a way to change directory. That's what CD stands for. And just to show you a quick example of how to use the CD command, we could just type CD. And then let's say we wanna go to this home directory. We just wanna go to that home directory. And this is what I was saying about relative path versus absolute path. But let's type home. And we can press enter and it'll take us to that directory. Uh, and as you can see right there, the tilde is gone. And now it's showing the actual location where you locate it. And the tilde was simply just a representation of home and Josh. Now this gives me the opportunity to show you guys a relative path, which basically means that the system understands where you are, which is the home directory right now or the home folder and a relative path would be to change directories to the Josh folder within home. And so if we press enter there, that'll get us back to our home directory. And just to add a little more, one thing about Linux, you could do things a number of different ways. So there's not one way to actually do certain things because that took us back to our home directory. And if we go back to the home folder by typing the path home and press enter, we can also simply type CD 
And that'll take us to our home directory as well, because by default, it will take you back to your home directory no matter where you are. It'll take you back to home Josh or whatever your user name is. Now, the next command I wanted to show you guys is the ls command. So let's type man and then ls, press enter, and that will give you the details of this actual command or the manual. It says list directory contents, and then it also gives you the synopsis on how to actually run it as well as the options. And let's hit the Q button just to get out of that. And I downloaded some files for us to play around with with this command and they're located in another directory so we have to use that cd command like we just used but we just need to type cd and then the folder that it's in is under the documents folder and there's a folder underneath it called ansible so all we have to do is type ansible examples and press enter and that'll change us our current location is within that Ansible directory. Now let's play around with the ls command. So all we have to do is type ls and press enter and that will list out the contents of the current working directory. So that's essentially how the ls command works. As you can see, you can see all the folders that are underneath it as well as the files that are underneath it. And if we go back to our explorer and we click in here under documents you'll see that ansible examples folder and you'll see the exact same information that was listed out within the terminal now this will be a good example to show you guys one of the options that you can run with the ls command and this will kind of show you how powerful the ls command is now within this directory there is a readme.md and Linux has hidden files and folders just like in the Windows operating system as well as Mac OS. But in order to make something hidden, Linux uses a different designator for hidden files, which is a period. So any file or folder that has a period within, within the front of it lets the Linux operating system know that this file is a hidden file. And so don't show it unless you have it set to where it shows hidden files. And it's readme.md. What I'm going to do is just change it by uh, going under rename and put a period in front of it. And that will actually hide that file. So we can hit rename. And as you can see, it disappeared. So that file is hidden now. But if we go back to the terminal, and we type ls, we'll see that that file has disappeared as well there. Well, a good example of how to use an option with the ls command or any commands in general, and that's why it's important to understand how to look at those man pages, is that there's a way to show hidden files while using the ls command. So we could just type ls, and then I know the option off the top of my head, but it's simply dash a for all. So that'll basically show you all the files, whether they're hidden or not hidden. So let's press enter, boom. And as you can see, it will show that, that hidden file. And by default, when I downloaded this GitHub directory, they already had hidden files within it. But I just wanted to show you guys how to hide something as well as how to see all the hidden files if you want to see it. Now there's another option I wanted to show you guys that you could run using the ls command. And one thing I want to do is clear the actual screen. And basically all this is doing is moving up, moving up all this information. So we're starting and it looks like it's a fresh terminal by typing the command clear. And as you can see, it just basically moved everything up. Now let me run the ls command again, just so you guys can see an example of what it shows when you run the ls command with no options but i also wanted to show you another option which is l so if we type ls and then dash l that stands for long or it's a long view and it puts it almost in a table so you can see a whole bunch of information associated with the specific files because right now all you see is just the files in general 
but you don't have any other information beside that, besides just the name of the folder. So if we press enter, boom, that will give us a lot more information. As you can see, it's broken out in a format that you will start to recognize and understand. And this goes into the permissions portion that I'll show you guys later on in the course. But as you can see, it gives you a whole lot more information about these folders. And it also shows you when they was actually created and also like the owner and the group of the actual files. So this lets you know that Josh, the user owns these folders and files. Now, one thing I want to show you guys as well, and we're going to use that L option again, but you can also run options together. So let's type LS and then dash L and the A option. And we don't have to put two dashes. We could just put them together and the system will understand it and press enter and that'll run it with the all and that'll bring in our hidden files and folders. So as you can see that git ignore file is there as well as the readme.md file is there as well. Now, let me show you one more option that you can actually add to this. And that is the H option, which puts things in a human readable format. And if we look at the man page, which I'm not going to open up again, but the H option is there, you'll see it. But one thing we're going to run is LS and then dash L and then the A option for all and then the H option. And just to kind of explain it before I run it, as you can see, all these files and folders are in a bytes format. That's the actual size of the files right there in this column right here in the middle. Uh, that is the size of the files and folders. Now, most folders are represented by 4K. That's typically the size of a folder. No matter how big something is in it, it'll show as 4K. But this is in the smallest format. So if let's say we're looking at a file that's a gigabyte in size. Well, if you run it without the H, it'll have the the size in bytes and it'll be hard to kind of figure out what it is. So let's press enter and that way I can show you the difference. So as you can see, it's in 4.0K. It, it basically puts it in the, the size to make it human readable. And as you can see, this file is 31 bytes and the readme.md is 121 bytes. Now let's go down and clear the screen again and press the CD button. That'll get us back to our home directory and we can clear again right fast just to get it back up to the top. And the next command I wanted to show you guys is the MKDIR, which is stands for make directory. Now let's go to that man page for that by typing man MKDIR and press enter and that'll open up that manual for us. And as you can see, it basically stands for make directories. And then there's a whole bunch of options. You can go through and check this out at your leisure, but let's go through and show you guys how to actually use it. So let's press Q to get us back to the terminal. And let's go to our documents folder by using that CD command we just learned and then type in the documents folder and press enter. And as you can see, now we're in that documents folder. And if we ls using the ls command we just learned, we could press enter and we can see that we only have one folder within this directory in the documents directory. So let's say we wanted to make another folder within this directory without using the GUI. Well, you can use the make directory command. So let's type mkdir and then you want to put the name of the directory that you want to create. So I'm going to just create a test, a test directory and press enter and that'll create that directory for us. And majority of the times when you run a command within the terminal, no output is a good thing that lets you know that the command ran successfully. Now, if something happened, then it would have given us a error. And just to give you a quick example of that, if we run that same command again to make the same directory name, so test with a capital T, press enter, you'll see it'll give you an error, basically saying it cannot create directory test file exists. So that means that folder is there. Now, 
let's use the ls command again so we can see that that folder has been created in that location so if we type ls press enter that'll show you all the folders that are in that directory and you should see that the test directory is there so now let's say we want to create a folder underneath it well the easiest way to actually do it is by typing cd and we can go into that test directory and make another folder so and let's type mkdir and then type test2 and press enter and it'll create us a folder underneath that directory so if we type ls boom under that directory you'll see that there is that folder of test2 now that kind of took a little bit longer and like i said in the linux terminal terminal there are multiple ways of skinning a cat i could have made both of those directories at one time and i'll show you guys that by using a option with the make directory and what i'm gonna do is cd from that directory and what i want to do is go back to the documents folder which is where we were where we created the first directory and let's ls again so we can verify where we are or we can also type in that print working directory which i won't print it out because we know what directory we're in by what's listed here the tilde which is our home directory and then the documents directory now let's make a parent folder and a child folder by using an option with the make directory command and all we have to do is type mk dir and then the option which is dash p and now we can specify a parent and a child directory and you can go as deep as you want when it comes to creating the folders for a full directory tree so the folder i want to create i'll just create a linux folder linux and then in order to create a folder underneath that folder we just have to put the forward slash and then let's type ubuntu and then let's say we wanted to create another folder underneath that just to take it to another level we could type josh in there and press enter and it will create that full directory tree so if we ls within this directory under documents where we created that linux directory you'll see that we have that linux folder now if we go in cd into the linux directory press enter and if we ls again that'll show us that we have that ubuntu folder that we created now if we cd into the ubuntu folder boom and you type ls again and you'll see that it has a josh folder and you guys should get the idea of how that actually works so i'm gonna clear the screen because i wanted to show you the next command which is how to remove a directory now let's cd to go back and then let's cd and in back into our documents directory and press enter and let's ls again so you guys can see the folders that are in that directory and the next command i wanted to show you guys is the remove directory command so let's type man and then rm dir press enter and that's the manual for the remove directory so it says remove empty directories now the word empty is very important when it comes to this command because you have to run an option in order to delete a folder that has either files or directories underneath it and i'll show you guys how to do that once we get to running the remove command so let's press q for quit and the first thing i want to do is go to that test directory and it's i just want to show you guys a simple way of deleting a folder so as you can see it has that test.2 directory underneath the test directory so in order to remove that test to directory and we know that that folder is empty because we didn't create anything underneath it so all we have to do is type remove dir and then we could just type in test two press enter and that'll remove that directory for us so if we type ls again you'll see that the test two directory is no longer there otherwise it would have listed just like up here when we first were in the ls directory now let's type cd and go back to our home directory now let's go back into this documents folder because i want to show you guys 
an option on how to delete a parent and child folder so if we uh, press enter there that'll get us back in that documents directory and let's type ls to list out that directory the contents of that directory now we know that the Linux folder has multiple folders underneath it and just to show you you cannot remove a directory with a directory I'm gonna run the remove command against that Linux directory that we created and press enter and as you can see it says fail to remove the Linux directory because it's not empty so in order to get by that we use the same option that we use to create a parent child folder when we ran the make directory command which is dash p and you'll start learning that a lot of the options are pretty much similar so let's run it now remove dir so rmdir dash p and then we have to specify all of the directories so if we type linux first and then there is a ubuntu directory underneath that and then the josh directory as well and if we press enter there that will delete that whole directory tree so all the folders underneath it are deleted as well as that folder and if we ls this directory again you'll see that it's fully gone okay cool so now that we understand how to manipulate directories now let's hop over and learn how to manipulate files or create files remove files and the first thing we need to understand is that all files on the linux operating system are case sensitive meaning that you can create files with the exact same name the only difference is the case of a particular character within that file and that will be recognized by the linux operating system as a totally different file and this is very different from the windows operating system in windows a file no matter where it is within the same directory can't have the exact same name no matter the case so this is one of the big differences while working with files in linux that you need to understand and then also not to fully confuse you guys but in the linux operating system everything is considered a file even directories they are considered a file by the Linux operating system. It's a special type of file, but it's considered a file nonetheless. Now, the first command I want to show you guys is the file command. It's very simple. So let's open up the man page for the file command. And we can type man and then file and press enter and that will bring up the manual for the file command so it says determines a file type and then here is the synopsis and then also the description of what is that how it's actually used and then we can go down to the bottom and it will also show you some options that can be used with the actual file command so let's quit and i'll show you guys some of the basic examples of using the file command and before I type the command, I just wanted to explain that the Linux operating system does not use extensions to determine a file type. Now, there are applications that sit on top that will use the file type to show you what application can open the file. But as far as the file type, it's not determined by the operating system, if that makes sense. So this is another reason why the file command is very important, especially if you're working in the command line full time. Now let's go into our documents directory and look at some of the files using the file command. So boom, and then let's ls this directory. Uh, let's actually go into the Ansible examples directory and then let's run the ls command again and let's actually go into another directory right fast within here and what I'm basically looking for is a simple file that we can just play around with and look at the file type so if we ls this directory we should find something yes and so what I'm gonna look at is the readme.md file and the way you use the file command is simply just the command itself, which is file, and then the file that you want looked at by the file command. So let's press enter. 
and that'll give us the information about this actual file. And as you can see, it's a text file. And that's basically what a MD, MD file is. It's basically markdown or markdown language, but it's, it's essentially a text file. And now, now let's run it against this uh, rolling update uh, .yaml. So let's type file and then rolling update.yaml and press enter and let's see what it brings up as well it brings up as a text file as well and let's go up one directory because i want to find another file so let's go to this Mon mongo db folder and let's see what's in here as well i think it's some images so an image directory and let's ls this directory now let's see what's in there so let's look at use the file command to actually look at one of these files now we already know by the extension what it is but this is a handy tool to give you more information about a file now as you can see this is the file name then this is a PN png image and you can look at the resolution of the actual file as well as the color color the rgb rgba and it says non interlaced but that's an image file, basically. So that should help you understand the file command. Now, the next command I wanted to show you is how to actually create files from the command line. So let's actually CD or change directory back to our home directory and clear the screen. And the command I wanted to show you guys is touch. So if we type man and then touch, this will give us the manual for the touch command and basically what it says is it's a change file time step, but the major purpose for using a touch command is to create files, but you can also do other things like change access and modification times, as well as, you know, basically create empty files. So let's go down and quit that and show you guys how to use the touch command. And let's get back into our documents directory and use the touch command to create a couple of files. Now the basic way to run the touch command is simply touch and then the file name. So we can name it file1.txt, press enter. And if we ls the documents directory, we'll see that file1 has been created. Now let's go ahead on and create multiple files using the touch command and basically all you have to do is list out the files so let's create we already have file one let's create file two dot txt and file three dot txt and that's the two files and i'm just basically showing you that you can create more than one file at a time using the touch command. You just have to separate them by a space. So let's press enter and then let's ls this directory again. And we'll see that all three of those files are there. And just like other commands, the touch command has, has a lot of options where you could change things about a particular file, but I won't go through that. I just wanted to show you the touch file and this is the simplest way to create empty files on your computer. Now that we learn how to create the files, let's go ahead on and learn how to remove a file, which is very simple. It's similar to the remove directory command, but instead of R-M-D-I-R, it's just simply R-M. So let's go to the man page for that right fast. So we could type man and then R-M. Press enter and it says remove files or directories. And it basically covers how to actually use the command as well as the description, just like all the other ones, and as well as options that you can use. So let's quit that and actually do some examples of removing these files that we already created. So the basic way to remove a file is simply RM and then the file name, which is uh, the one, the file one.txt, which is the first one I wanna delete. So we can press enter and that'll delete that file. So if we run the ls command, we'll see that file one has been removed. Now, the same way with the touch command, you can specify multiple files. So all we have to do is type rm, and then what I wanna do is show you guys one of the options for the remove command, which is dash i, which is considered the interactive mode. 
And it's basically a way of running the command where it verifies that you want to delete these files. So let's uh, type in our file names. So file2.txt and file and file3.txt and press enter. And it will go through and it will make you verify each one of these files. And it says remove regular empty file. And you have to respond by typing yes and press enter and I'll delete that file. And then we have to type yes again and I'll delete that file. So now let's run the ls command again. And both of those files have been successfully deleted from the file system. Now, don't you guys remember how I said there's more than one way to skin a cat within the Linux terminal? Well, you can also use the remove command to remove directories like it's stated within the man page. And I wanted to show you guys how to do that now uh, by using this test directory that's already there. And in order to remove that directory, all we have to do is type rm and let's try it without using any options. And let's type uh, test and press enter because I wanted to show you guys what the response is as far as the error that will pop up when you try to remove it without using any of the options. And as you can see, it says cannot remove test is a directory. So in order to remove a directory, you can use RM and then there's an option of recursive. That's what the R stands for recursive and then force. And this will force the remove command to remove that directory. So let's press enter and that should remove that directory and we can LS this directory. As you can see, that test directory is gone now. So I just wanted to throw that in there so you guys can see that there are multiple ways of doing things within the command line. Now let's go down and clear the screen again. And the next thing I want to do is show you guys how to copy files. So the first thing I want to do is create a directory so we can go make dir and then let's create a directory called test under the documents directory and let's ls to make sure that directory was created. Now let's create a file within the test directory so we can just cd to that directory. That's the simplest way and press enter and then ls this directory. As you can see, nothing is in there. So now we can use the touch command. So touch and then file one dot txt and press enter. That'll create that file within the directory. And as you can see, it's listed there once we run the ls command. Now, let's say we want to copy that file within that same location. Well, all we have to do is type the copy command, which is CP. Now, the first thing before I copy, I want to show you guys the man page for it. So man copy, basically copy files and directories, and then all the options that you can use with the command. So let's go down and quit that and let's run the command and, and do some examples. So all we have to do is type CP. And then you want to specify the file you want to copy. And then you want to specify where you want it and the file name. So we want it in the same directory. So we don't have to type anything before the file name. We can name it file one CP dot TXT and press enter. And then if we LS this directory, we'll see that we have the copy file and the original file that we copied from. Now, let's say we wanted to copy one of these files to a specific directory within the file structure. All you have to do is type copy the CP command, and then let's copy that same file. So file one dot txt, and we want to copy it to a specific location. Let's copy it and put it within our documents directory. Now we could just type the absolute path. That way we know for sure we're getting the file in the correct location. So we could put the forward slash, which is our roots, and then the home directory, and then Josh. And then let's say we wanna put it in that documents directory like we stated. And that's all we pretty much have to do unless we wanna rename the file. And we'll just place it in that location by pressing enter. And if we ls this directory, you'll see that file one is still there, but we can ls a specific directory by typing a full path. So we can go forward slash home Josh and then documents and press enter. 
and that'll show us that file one that we put in that location. Now let's go up one directory and the way you go up one directory, if I didn't show you guys this, but it's CD change directory dot dot and that'll take you up one directory. As you can see, we went up one directory in a tree and I believe I forgot to explain that when we covered the CD command. I just wanted to keep it simple and not confuse people, but that is the way you move up one directory while using the CD command. Now back to the copy command. If we want to copy a directory, it's a little bit different. We have to use an option of dash or in order to copy that directory as well as all the files within it. So all we have to do is type CP dash or, and then we want to copy that test directory, that test directory. And I want to put it in the same location. So it's the exact same thing. All we have to do is type out a name. So let's go test. And then CP, that's the name of the directory and press enter. And if we LS our documents directory, we should see two folders in there now, one of test and one of test CP, which is the copy. Now let's LS that directory as well. So let's go test CP because I wanted to show you guys that it does have those files in there that we created under test. So that should be a clear example of how to actually use the CP command. Now let me clear the screen right fast because the next command I wanted to show you guys has two features involved with it. And it's basically the move command. You can move files and then you can also rename files. And this is what a lot of people use the move command for. For instance, if you have a file named file one and you want it to be named file two within the same directory, a lot of times people will use the move command to actually rename those files within the command line because it's basically a faster command. It's just two letters in order to rename a file. So before I show you the command, let's go to the man page as normal and the move command, let's press enter. And as you can see in the man page, it even says that you can rename files with it. And it also goes through the description as well as all the options for using the command. But I'm going to show you guys the simplest ones. If you want to get more advanced, then definitely check out the man page. But let's quit and then let's ls this documents directory again. Because I want to show you guys the simplest way to run the move command by renaming file1.txt. And I'm going to do exactly that example that I said a few minutes ago. So let's just type move and then file name, uh, file1.txt. And we want to rename it to file2.txt. And we'll leave it in that same directory so we don't have to put the path in front of it. And we can press enter and then let's ls this directory. And we'll see that file one is now file two. So that's in a simple example of using the move command to rename files. And then you can also move the file through that process by specifying a absolute path, which I'll show you guys now. And so let's type move. And then let's capture that file to file. And we want to move it to the test directory. And then let's also rename it to file three, just to show you guys, you can do all this in one command. So let's press enter and that will move file two. And if we LS this directory, just to show you guys that it's gone. Now let's LS the test directory and press enter. And that'll show us that we have that file three in there. So basically we moved and renamed at the exact same time by using one command. And you can also do the exact same thing for directories with the move command. So let's LSD documents directory again. And what I want to do now is rename the test CP to test PC. And I apologize. I typed the wrong command. <laughs> I put the remove command in there, which I meant to put MV. So apologize for that, but let's go down and move forward. But we're going to run that same command. I'm just going to change it to the right command. And I'm glad that didn't work 
<laughs> because it's a directory i would have lost that file or a directory but anyway let's run it now and we should be good to go so let's ls this directory now and it should be test pc so i apologize for that and even your instructor makes mistakes but let's keep rolling right on with it and by showing you guys all these commands you should be able to manip manipulate files within the linux file system so make sure you practice these commands because once you master these commands then there are more commands and more options that you can use in the future Okay, cool. So now that we understand how to work with directories and files, now I want to show you guys how to work with the content within a file. And there are a couple commands that I wanted to show you guys that will help you do this. Now, the first command I wanted to show you guys is the head command. And as always, with the every command, I will show you the man page first. So head, press enter. As you can see, it outputs the first port of a file. Now, the purpose of this command, it will print out the first 10 lines of a file and it'll do it right within the terminal. And this is so you can get an idea of what's actually in the file. So let's quit the man page right fast by pressing Q and let's find a file to actually use the head command on. So let's LSD documents directory. And I may need to go into another directory. Yeah, let's go into the Ansible directory. Again, press enter and LS again. So we can list out the contents. And let's go on and run the head command against the readme.md file. So let's just go down and type head and then readme.md and press enter. As you can see, it pulls the first 10 lines. Now it's a little hard to count, but the spaces are actually a line as well. So that's why it shows content on blank lines as well as lines with content on it. But it's the first 10 lines of the actual file. Now there is an option where you can show a certain amount of lines. Let's say you only wanna see the first five lines of this same file. So let's press up. Let's actually run that command again and run dash five and press enter. And that will show you the first five lines of that line instead of the default of 10. So that's a cool way of actually using the head command. And now that we know how to use that command, I wanted to show you another command that's very similar to this one. And the difference between this command, the head command, and the command I'm about to show you is that it shows you the last 10 lines of a file. So it's beneficial to use both of these commands if you're trying to figure out what's in a file without opening up the full file. And the command I'm talking about is the tail command. So we could type man, man, tail, and press enter. And as you can see, it says outputs the last port of a file and the exact same thing as the head command, but it's the total opposite while showing you the last 10 lines of the file. So let's go down and quit that and let's run the tank tail command against that same file and press enter. And as you can see, it pulls the last 10 lines of that actual file. And just so you guys know, this file doesn't have much data in it. I believe it has about 10 lines in it. That's why it's showing the exact same information as the head command. So let me find another command to give you a better example. So we can go into the lamp uh, directory and press enter. And let's ls this directory and let's find a better file to actually look at and let's look at the site.yaml file and let's run the head first so head against the site file and press enter as you can see it pulls in the first 10 lines now let's run the tail command the exact same way and press enter and you'll see that the information is different and that's the last 10 lines of that file and I wish I would have found this file first because it's a better example. As you can see, 
the information is totally different from when we ran it the first time on the original file, which only had a little bit of content in it. Now, let's go down and clear right fast. And I wanted to show you another command, which is the cat command. And since we're deep in a directory, let's go down and make the terminal full screen. That way you guys can actually see everything. And let's clear the screen again and run man cats, which is a command I'm about to show you now. And cat is short for concatenate files. And basically what this command is used for is to print out all the content of a file not just the first 10 lines not just the last 10 lines but the full file itself so let's quit that and let me show you guys how to actually run that now so we could just run cats and then the site uh dot yaml file press enter and as you can see it pulls in that whole file uh, and we can scroll up and see it but as you can see that's the full file right there so that's just a quick way of printing out everything now the cat command as i stated stands for concatenate so you can take information or content from multiple files and concatenate that information into one big file using the cat command that's one of the more advanced features of the cat command so let me show you guys how to actually do this by creating a couple files and then I'll concatenate the information within each one of those files into one big file. Now let's, let's CD and then clear the screen right fast so I can bring everything up to the top so you guys can see. Now let's change directories to our documents directory. Press enter and let's ls this directory because I'm gonna have to create a couple files right fast. And I haven't shown you guys the echo command, but this is the simplest way of actually creating a file along with the content in it. So let's first look at the man page for echo. I just wanted to show you guys uh, this right fast, but echo, press enter, and it'll display a line of text. That's just, It's a simple command that's been around for a very long time that allows you to display information. And really, all we have to do is type echo, and then we could type some text. So, and then I want to write D and put it into an actual file within this directory. And all we have to do is type text one or whatever you want to name it. Dot txt and press enter, and that'll echo D into that file name as well as create that file for us and if we ls this directory right fast just so you guys can see you'll see that text one is there and if we cat out that file and i just wanted to show you guys this if we cut out that file and press enter you'll see that the word d is in there now let's run the same exact command uh echo and let's put something different in there so and just so you guys know what i'm doing is pressing the up arrow that'll show you commands that you've already ran but let's see the and let's write big to this actual file and let's press enter and that's text too and let's run it one more time and let's create a file called test text three and let's put a word in here as well, the big apple. So it'll write apple to that form, to that file. Now let's cut out each one of those files right fast so you guys can see exactly what's in each one of those files. And we'll start with test one, press enter, and then test two, and then test three, or text three press enter and so as you can see it says the big apple now watch this if we run the cat command against all three of those commands we'll see all the text printed out from each one of those text files so let's type cat and then we can type test text one and then text two and then text three and press enter 
And as you can see, it puts it all together. So that's what the concat that's what concatenates means. It'll put the content of multiple files into one printout and you can also extract it all to another file which is a little bit more advanced but i just wanted to show you that it is possible to do this by simply we can run the same exact can't command but instead of it outputting to the terminal i want it to output that information to a file so let's create another file and all we have to do is type the greater than sign and we can name the file all.txt and press enter. And if we ls this directory, we'll see that we have another file now called all. So if we cut out the all file right fast, we'll see that that text is there. So it basically took the text from text one, text two, text three, and put it all into one file, which is super cool. And just think of the possibilities by doing something like this. If you have a, a file with a hundred lines in it or a couple files with a hundred lines in each one of them and you want them to be combined, you can use this simply the cat command in order to do this. Now, let's say you want to create a file and you want to type the content within that file. Well, I'm going to show you guys the simplest way by using the cat command. This is another feature of the cat command. And let me clear the screen so we can get it back up to the top. But let's let's start off by creating the file using the cat command. And what we need to do is put the greater than sign and then we can name the file whatever we want it. So let's name this file one dot txt and press enter. And then as you can see, the cursor is stuck to the left hand side. That's because we're using the cat command to create the file and then write the content into the file. So all we have to do is type in whatever we wanted to say. So I could type, I am having a good day, period. And then you can actually add more than one line. You don't have to keep typing. You just press enter. And I will take you to the next line and then you can continue typing. I hope you are too. Now, let's say you're finished done writing everything you want within this file. In order to save it, all you have to do is hold the control button and press D. And it'll drop you back down to the command line. Now, I know that's kind of weird where it put it, but let's press enter just to get it out the way. And now let's actually cat that file right fast so we can see exactly what's in it and press enter and that'll cut out that information for us and i should have put a return at the end of it that's why it's putting the, the terminal prompt right after the end of the file which makes it kind of look weird but that's essentially how it works but with if you follow that process you can create the file write in the content that you want to write in into the file and then save the file in that location now let's press enter again because i want to ls this directory because i don't think we i showed you that the file was actually there but as you can see file one that's that actual file now there's another cool feature of cat that i wanted to show you guys you can actually copy files or you can use it as a copy for a particular file and if we cat out uh, file one again that way we can look at the text again so you guys can actually see what's in it we can actually copy that file and rename it something else by using the cat command like this so we could just type cat file one and then all you have to do is put the greater than sign and then name the file whatever you want to so i'll just name it file two dot txt and press enter and if we ls this directory again, you'll see that there is a file two. And if we run the cat command against file two, that will show us the contents of that file, which is exactly the same as file two. All right, cool. So now we understand that. Let's uh, clear the screen because I wanted to show you another command that helps when working with files. Now, this is typically used when you have a very large file that you're trying to go through and look at. And this command is called more. So we could type man and then more. 
and this will give you information about it but basically it just parses out data to your terminal but it allows you to tab through different pages and i'll show you guys how to actually use it uh, once we get into it and I found a quick file, let's see, under the Ansible directory and then the LAMP directory, HP, I believe, proxy, press enter, and let's ls this directory. I just want to try to find it uh, and the provision.yaml file. So let's run more against provision.yaml file, press enter. And as you can see at the bottom now, this is by running uh, more more shows you the percentage of the file that you're at as well as you can tab through per page instead of going line by line with the cat command where it just kind of prints out everything let's say you want to look at everything line uh page by page if you hit the space button bar that'll go to the next page and if you hit it again that'll go to the end of the page and that's a super beneficial command as well. Now, there is an alternative that some people like to use, which is less. And I'll show you guys that now using it against that same command. But first, let's go to the man page for less, just so you guys can see it. But it says the opposite of more. So let's type it in and just run it right fast. So let's go less. And then the provision and file again, just press enter. And as you can see, it's pretty much the same. You could tab as well and you can go back up, you know what I'm saying? And back down, you can go line by line as well with this command. But if you hit space, that'll take you down to the end. And all you have to do is hit the Q command. And that'll quit the actual command. But that's essentially a high overview of the less command and the more command. And this concludes all the commands I'll show you that'll allow you to manipulate the content within a file on the Linux operating system. So let's move on to the next segment. Okay guys, so in the next segment, I want to show you guys a high level overview of how the Linux file six system is structured. And I'll show you by basically bringing up the full file structure in the terminal and then break down each directory underneath the file system. So let's go down and hit CD and then the forward slash. And this represents the root of the file system. And every file included within the operating system is stored under this one location. It's similar to the Windows operating system how everything is structured under the C drive. Well, it's the same thing, but a little bit different within the Linux operating system. So let's press enter there. And what I want to do is run the LS command and then I'll run the dash L option. And this will give us the full structure of the operating system. And I'm going to scroll up right fast a little bit just to put it all in so that everything is listed out. And I'll go through and break down each one of these folders. And like I said, this will be a high overview because I don't want to go too deep and confuse new users of the Linux operating system. I just basically want to explain what a lot of these folders are used for. And this will give you a better understanding of how the operating system works. OK, and the first directory I want to show you guys is the bin directory. And this is where most of your binary files are stored. Now, this means Linux terminal commands and core utilities, such as the CD command, which we just used, uh, the PWD command, which is print working directory, which I showed you guys a little earlier, as well as the move command and so on. Pretty much this is where all those binary files are stored. Now, the next directory is the boot directory. And this is a very important directory and you don't want to go playing around in this directory. This is where all the needed files for the for Linux to boot or kept. And a lot of people that are used to running Linux, they typically separate this directory on a different partition from the remainder of the operating system, especially when you're working or doing dual booting. But that's a little high level for you guys. I just wanted to give you guys an overview of what this folder is for. And just a, a little bit more of an idea of what's located in this directory. 
is the boot files as well as grub most of the time which is a small program that allows you to select the operating system and boot the operating system now the next directory is cd-rom and that's obviously where your cd drive is stored so anytime you put a disk into your linux operating system it'll show up under cd-rom now the next directory i want to really talk about is the dev directory that's the next directory down and this is where all your physical devices are mounted so all your hard drives uh usb optical drives and the reason i say optical drives cd drives because they can be mounted under this location or stored under this location as well it just all depends on the different distributions different distributions store things in different places sometimes they have a extra directory here and there that's why i didn't talk much about the cd rom folder which is obviously that's what that's for the cd drive but typically that's stored and depending on the distribution, the CD-ROM drives are stored under dev as well. But all your hard drives are stored in this location. They're, they're actually mounted from that location. And also if you have like multiple partitions on a single drive, those will be stored under this location as well. And you'll see that once you start really diving in how to partition a hard drive for your Linux operating system. Now, the next directory I want to explain to you guys is the ETC directory, and it basically stands for Etsy. But this is where all the configuration files are stored, and this is for all the applications that are installed on the Linux operating system. So let's say you want to install an Apache server. Well, they'll have configuration files stored under the etc. directory or if you want to set up MySQL, or if you're trying to modify your SSH connections or your configuration for your SSH server, then the configuration file is underneath there. And most of your configuration files have an extension of conf, so C-O-N-F. Okay, and so the next directory is basically the home directory. And I kind of explained this when I was showing you guys how to navigate the Linux file system by using the CD command. Well, the home directory is where all the username folders are stored. So anytime a new user is created on the system, depending on if that option is selected or not, a home folder is actually created. And this is where all your documents and photos and video files, they're all stored under that user's home directory, which is stored under this home folder. Now, the next folder is the lib directory. And this is where binaries are kept. And a lot of times you'll notice that many, that many times when installing Linux packages, additional libraries are automatically downloaded. And they almost always end up in the lib directory somewhere. And just to simply put it, these files or files that are needed for your program to work on Linux. And just to relate it to Windows, you can think of this folder is somewhat an equivalent of the program files folder on windows but keep in mind it's not a hundred percent exactly the same and just to explain these other folders that are in there that says lib lib 32 is basically if you have a 32 bits piece of software this is where the libraries are stored for that as well as system 64 bit software that is where those libraries files are stored as well and then there's a lib x32 and this contains library files as well now the media directory which is the next directory i'm going to skip over that lost and found that's just a typical folder that's in aext4 partition but the media directory is basically another place where external devices such as usb drives whenever you plug them in they'll they'll pop up in there or you can mount them in there and it all depends on the Linux distribution. Sometimes you may not even see that media directory. You'll see a mount directory, which is the next one I wanted to show you guys. And this is basically a placeholder folder used for mounting folders or drives. And this is where I typically mount external drives or remote drives to my operating system. And like I stated, it's simply a placeholder. And a lot of times I'll create multiple folders underneath that, depending on where I'm connecting to. Let's say I'm connecting to a shared drive or I want to mount a shared drive on another server that's within my network. 
and I want it to always mount to that location, I'll create a folder for it and I'll name it like the server name or something or the share name. And then I'll set it up where that share drive is mounted at that location every single time the system boots up. Now, the next folder is the opt directory. And this is for optional software for the system. And that's the simplest way to put it. And I never have used the op directory for anything, but it all depends on the distribution you're using as well. Now, the proc directory is an important directory as well. This is the processes folder where a lot of systems information is represented as files. And it basically provides a way for the Linux kernel to send and receive information from various processes running in the Linux environment. Now, the next directory is the root directory. And this is different from the actual root location. This is basically the home directory for the root account. You know, like we have the home folder and then Josh, where there is a built-in user called root that has full permissions to pretty much everything on the system. With Ubuntu, they have this account disabled by default, but it has its own home directory. So if you ever logged into that root account, which I don't recommend, this is where the files are stored for the root directory. So if you download something, uh, it'll default to the root directory while you're running as the root user. Now the next directory is the run directory and this is where a lot of drives are auto mounted uh, when you like plug in a USB drive. And this is something that's really only relevant to desktop environments. So if you have a desktop environment installed, a lot of times they'll have the run directory under your root where a lot of those drives that are like auto mounted to the system they'll pop up under run and you can unmount them from that location. And let's say you want to mount them under the mount directory or the MNT directory, then you can easily do that. But they put that there for newer modern Linux distributions so that when you plug in a USB drive, it'll automatically mount at that location. I don't normally use it, but it is there for a lot of users that are transitioning from different operating systems just to make it more user friendly. Now, the next directory is sbin, and it's similar to the bin directory, except that it's dedicated to certain commands that can only be run by the root user or super user. And this directory kind of depends on the distribution as well. Now, the temp directory, this is basically where files are temporarily stored. And most of the time when you shut down the system, it'll delete those files from that directory. And I actually missed one of the directories and that's Snap. Snap is a new way of actually installing applications by somewhat containerizing the application uh, using, they call it Snap packages. And you'll see that a lot in Ubuntu systems, but this is where that is stored. Now, the US or directory, it basically contains files and utilities that are shared between users. That's why I call it, I, I just said the US or, but it's, I typically call it the user directory. That's simply what that is. It's just utilities that are shared between users. And then the VAR directory is basically where variable data is kept. And it's usually system logs, but can also include other types of data as well. Like for instance, if you're running this thing as a server, then the default location for Apache is var, and then there's a folder underneath that called www, and then HTML. So that's where that's actually stored as far as files. And then they also have log files within there. Like if you're running a server and you have an Apache server setup, then you typically will see your log files under var. And there's a directory called log. And then also under the root directory, you'll see a swap file, uh, depending on if you have swap on the system. And typically if you install it without making any changes or modifying the way the system is set up, you just take the defaults when you're going through the installation, then you'll typically have a swap file. And this is just an extra place to store things that are stored in memory that haven't been accessed for a while. So let's say you have a browser open, but then you go over and start working on something else. And you eventually get to the point where it needs to store, your system needs to store some information that you have open that you're not currently using. Well, sometimes it'll write it to the swap file. So that's essentially what that is. 
but that's pretty much the Linux file structure. I just wanted to cover it this way just to make it super simple where I just talked about each one of the directories and you can see them on the system as I go through them. So let's go down and move on to the next section. In this next segment, I want to cover some systems information commands that you can run within the Linux terminal. Now, when you have a desktop environment, there are GUI tools that can provide most of the information that I'm going to show you within the command line. But it's a good idea to at least understand how to get this information from the command line. And just to show you the GUI version of kind of what I'm going to show you from the command line, I just wanted to open it up right fast. You can basically go hit the activities and then you can search in here for a system and you should bring up the system monitor. And like I said, this will give you a lot of information. So this is the system processes that are running on the system. Uh, and this is similar to opening up the computer management on Windows systems. But you can see your resource information as well, uh, file system information as well. So hard drives and all that good stuff. Now I'm gonna show you how to look at all this information from the command line because all this information is pulled from some of the folders that I actually showed you within the Linux file system. And it's just put in a graphical user interface so you guys can see it a little bit better, but you can easily do the exact same thing from the command line, which I will go down and show you now. So let's go down and close this and open up the terminal. And let's zoom in again. And sorry, I closed it, but I need to, show you guys the GUI version of the commands I'm about to show you. Now let's start off with a couple basic commands. Like for instance, I wanted to show you guys uptime, uptime. So we could type man, man, uptime, just to show it to you, but it basically tells you how long the system has been running. So let's quit that and let's run uptime and press enter and that's basically the information that it gives you it gives you the time that the system has been up as well as the amount of users and the load average of the cpu which is some of the information that's pulled into that system monitor now the next command i wanted to show you guys is the free command and this deals with memory so we could type man and then free and press enter and as you can see, it says displays amount of free and use memory in the system. So we can press Q for quit and run free. All I'm going to do is just run the basic command, but it gives you this, this information for the memory usage on your system. And like I said, I just kind of wanted to show you guys a high overview or the base level of what the command is used for. Because a lot of these commands are used by systems administrators, because when you're running a server, you don't have a graphical interface. You have to do everything from the command line. And I don't want to make this course too advanced. I just want to touch on some of these commands because it will definitely help you when you start going for Linux certifications. Now, the next command I wanted to show you guys is the PS command. And this command will sh display Linux processes that are currently going on. It's, and it's simply a snapshot. So it won't refresh. It'll just pull in what's currently happening at the moment on the Linux operating system as far as snaps, as far as processors, processes that are running on the system. So the first thing, let me open up the man page for the PS command, just so you can see that it does have a man page as well as some detailed description on how to use it. But the basic way I typically run it is PS and then dash capital A. This is the only way I think you should actually run it. And like I said, this is just a snapshot of all the processes. So let's say you need to kill a process because occasionally that happens. Uh, you need to go in and kill a process. Well, this is the process ID right here. Uh, that number that shows the process ID. So you can actually kill a process if you need to via the command line. I won't show you guys how to do that, but that's something you may have to do in the future once you get a little bit more familiar with using the operating system. 
Now let's get into some hard drive or hard disk commands that I wanted to show you guys from the command line. And I don't know if you remember, but within that system monitor application, you'll see that it showed some of the disk information and partitions and all that stuff. Well, let me show you how to find that information from the command line if you need it. And the first command I wanted to show you guys was the DF command. So let's type man DF. And basically this reports file systems, disk space usage. So let's go down and quit the man page and run the command. And we could just run it. It has a number of options, but I'll just run it just to show you guys how to actually use it. But as you can see, it pulls in a lot of information based on the disk space. Like for instance, this is the partition that housed the root directory. And you can tell by it being moved, mounted or the mount location, but it's mounted at root. So that pretty much holds the operating system right there. And just to make the information look a little bit better so you can understand it because it's kind of hard to read this stuff in bytes. Well, there is an option just like I showed you on other commands, but it's dash H for human readable. And that'll basically give you the sizes in a readable format. And as you can see, that breaks it out right there. So as you can see, the full size is 30 gigabytes and the operating system is taking up about nine gigabytes and you have 21 gigabytes available. And so 31% is actually taken up. But this is a lot of great information you can get about hard drives and hard disks and partitions that are connected to your Linux operating system. Now let's clear right fast because I want to show you guys another command and it's called fdis. So let's type man fdis and press enter. And as you can see, you can manipulate disk partition tables. Now this is a great command, but just to pull information about your partitions, you want to run the dash L option, which is represented right here. So that's the way we're going to run it. That's typically how I pull information that I'm trying to see about partitions on the system. So F this dash L and press enter. And it may not work because you need permissions. And this is where the sudo command actually comes in on. And I'll still cover that sudo command in the next segment, but I'll just run it so you guys can kind of see. But I really want to explain what sudo is actually used for in the purpose of the actual program. But sudo and then f this dash l and press enter and it should access for our user account password or our pseudo password, so to speak. And this gives you a little bit more information about all the partitions on the system. And as you can see right here, this is our main hard drive again, a VDA 32 gig, uh, and it breaks out all the different partitions as well as the partition types and the sizes and all that good information about the disk. Now, let me clear it because I wanted to show you one more command that I think is beneficial for you guys to actually learn or check out. But let's type man. And then there's another one called ls block. And let's press enter. And as you can see, it lists block devices. So let's press Q and actually run the command. So let's go ls block and see the results that actually comes up. And as you can see, it gives you a little bit more information, but as you can see, it breaks it down a little further. It shows you the boot locations of pretty much everything or the mount points, which it did using the other command. But this is just another command that can help you while you're trying to check on disks that are connected to the system. And I know you guys are probably wondering, what are these loopbacks? Just ignore them. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. A lot of times that's just special block devices that are mapped to like normal files and it shows up as a virtual block device. That's essentially what that is. Now, let me go down and clear again, but now let's put all this information together. I showed you guys how to look at the processes that are running on the Linux operating system, as well as the CPU load, the uptime, and the memory information. Well, there are some built-in utilities that you can use to look at all this information, just like you would in the GUI version, but it's for the command line. So the first one I wanted to show you guys is top. So if we run man top, 
this will just give you some information about it but it basically says displays Linux processes but it, it displays more information than what you think so let's go down and hit Q and just run top so you guys can see it and as you can see it will update just like the processes were updating in the GUI but this is all on the command line it's a little bit difficult to understand if you don't know what you're looking for so that's why I wanted to throw in the other one and the way you get out of it you just hit Q and that will drop you back down to the terminal but let's clear again and let's run man htop and I'm 100% sure this application is stored stored on here and it might not have a, a manual but I'm sure this application is on here but so let's go on and install it right fast because uh, I want you guys to actually see it because there are some utilities that have gotten a facelift and as you can see htop it has the same word in it as top you know what I'm saying it just has a facelift so it'll look a little better within the command line and you can get a little bit more information and it runs pretty much the same as top okay cool so it's installed let's uh, run htop and as you can see it gives it a, it gives a better representation of, of what you're actually looking for and I recommend you install htop if you don't have it installed on your system most systems comes come with htop installed by default I'm not sure why you want to decided to remove that but htop is a very valuable utility that's beneficial when trying to troubleshoot applications so as you can see you can get out of it using f10 or q and that'll exit out of htop so that concludes this segment showing you guys how to get some systems information from the command line so i'll see you guys in the next one now the next command i wanted to show you guys was dealing with networking now if you have a desktop environment there probably is a network manager uh, in the GUI and I'll just go there so you can see it but under wired connections you can go to wired settings and this will bring up the network connections which is under settings and you can go through and modify your settings as far as like setting a static IP address or changing up your DNS servers you know all that good stuff you you can do it right here within the GUI but I also just wanted to show you how to gather that information from the command line by showing you two specific commands the first one is an older command that has been around for a very long time but it's called if config similar to IP config on a Windows operating system so I have config press let me just go to the man page and it looks like it, it isn't a man page and they might have removed this command from the system um, because I know it's becoming the oldest version or it's like an older version to look at the IP addresses associated with the system yeah and as you can see it's not on the system by default so squad on and install that as well so let's go sudo apt install and you can easily install these uh, packages that way you can use some of these tools that I'm going through you can follow this I'm just writing sudo app install and then the net tools and I know I haven't covered the software management uh, piece but I'll get into that in a little bit I just wanted to show you guys these commands that should be on the system by default it all depends on the distribution that you're using because you could probably install a Debian uh, operating system and it may or may not have this tool on it but I still wanted to show it to you guys because it's still relevant it's something that a lot of people still use but I'll show you the newest version of this command in a couple seconds next now let's uh, clear the screen and run if config and press or actually let's go to the manual because it should have a manual now so I have config press enter that'll open it up and basically what it says is configure a network interface so most people use it just like IP config just to get the get the IP information on your system so I have config press enter and as you can see it pulls up the network device which that is the name of the network device on this system yours may have a different name but it's essentially the exact same thing and as you can see this is my IP address as well as the IP version 6 address there as well 
and other basic networking information. Uh, now, I won't cover all of this, but I just wanted to at least show you how to gather that information. Now, the newest version of this command is actually IP, and this should be installed by default now. Uh, man IP, yes, and it is. It says shows, manipulate, routing, network devices, interfaces, and tunnels. And this is a way more detailed command. Uh, there's a lot of options that go along with this command. And hence, this is why it's replacing I of config. So let's press Q to quit to get out of it. And let's clear and just run IP and press enter. And that should show you the help. But I wanted to go, let's uh, IPA. That'll pull all the IP information. As you can see, it pulls up basically the same information. Uh, this is the device name right here, as well as all the IP addresses underneath it. So IP version four and IP version six, as well as your other device information on this system. And once you learn this command, you can make changes to it. You can set an IP address, a static IP address, or you can add more connections to it and force your system to pull another IP address. And you can change how you route route traffic. But a lot of that goes into the systems admin type of roles. But I at least wanted to cover the command so you guys can see how to actually gather this information if you need to. So within this segment, we're going to cover the sudo command as well as the software center and the apt package manager which is what you'll use to manage software. Now, before we get to the package manager, as well as the software center, I wanted to talk about the sudo command, just so you guys can get a clear understanding of what it actually is. And just to simply break it down for you, sudo stands for super user do, and it's used to access uh, restricted files and operations. Because by default, the Linux operating system restricts access to certain ports of the system, preventing sensitive files from being compromised. And what happens when you run the sudo command, it temporarily elevates privileges, allowing users to complete sensitive tasks without logging in as the root user. So first thing I want to do is run man and sudo that way you can get a little bit more information about it and like i said i always run these man commands so you guys can see where to get the information for each one of these commands so let's press enter uh sudo and it says x ex execute a command as another user and typically is used to elevate a user to a super user status or as the root user of the system and the simplest way to relate it to a Windows operating system, when you want to run something as administrator, you right click on the application and hit run as administrator. Now, it doesn't ask you for a password, you know, in Windows, but you do have to take that extra step to run things as the administrator. It'll just simply pop up with a prompt asking you if you want to run this application as an administrator. But in Linux, it's totally different. You have to type in your password anytime you want to elevate your privileges. So let's go on and quit. And the way I'm going to show you guys is what I typically use the sudo command for, and that is updating your system. Now, there are multiple ways of updating it. I believe in earlier ports of the course, I covered how to install packages within the software center, which I'll bring it up after this just to show you that it's actually using sudo while using the software center as well. But I wanted to cover in the command line how to update the system. But before I do that, let's run the man command against apt as well, because most applications do have a manual. And this is the case for the app package manager. And as you can see, it says command line interface. And what it's used for is to install and update packages. Now let's go down and quit that. I just wanted to kind of show it to you. But apt actually stands for advanced package management tool. And basically it facilitates the process of installing and uninstalling Linux software packages. And apt is typically 
the package manager for Debian based distributions. So majority of Debian based distributions will have the apt package manager installed and ready for you to use to install packages on the system. And depending on what distribution you are using, there are other package managers out there. But like I stated, I wanna focus on apt. So now let's use the sudo command and app command to update our system. Now the first command I'm gonna run is sudo apt update. And just to break this command down, uh, first we're using sudo to elevate our privileges because we can only make changes to the operating system files if we elevate our privileges because a lot of the packages the, where the binaries are and all that stuff, is in an area that's owned by the root user of the operating system. And in order for us to make changes to it, we have to elevate our privileges so that we're running the command as root. So that's just simply what the sudo command is for. And then we have apt, which is our package manager. And then there's an option called update. And what update will do, just to break it totally down, most Linux distributions have repositories where they store authorized software that you can install in the system. And the update command basically updates the cache of the available packages to your operating system. And this is something that you want to do because it'll let you know if you have updates. So if it's, if a new package is on their repository that's installed on your system, then it'll let you know after running the update command. So let's go down and run it now so you guys can kind of see what it's, what it's gonna do. And anytime you run sudo, you have to type in your password for your user account unless it's timed out because I believe it's a time period of five minutes or so. Once you authenticate once, if you run the sudo apt updated command again within that five minute time period, it won't ask you for the, for the password again. And so, Basically, what it's doing is hitting all the Ubuntu servers where packages are stored and it's refreshing that the cache on the system. And as you can see, we have three packages that can be updated on the system now. And so in order to update our packages, there's another command. You basically run sudo apt upgrade. This is how you actually upgrade those packages. So you have to use the upgrade option with the apt package manager in order to upgrade the packages. Cause right now it didn't do the update. It just told you that you had updates to the actual packages, but in order to upgrade them, you have to type upgrade. And just to point this out right, right fast, you can actually look at what's being updated by uh, running apt list and then dash dash upgradable. That'll list out the actual packages that are about to be upgraded before you run the upgrade command. So now let's just go on and run it. So you guys can see an update to the system. And then right here, it kind of shows you what packages are being updated. And right now the Python three update manager is being updated. Uh, update manager is being updated and update manager core is being updated. And then it tells you three upgraded applications will be installed and it also tells you how much additional space will be taken up by these upgrades so as you can see that's not much uh, but let's go down and press enter or you could type y for yes and that's basically confirming that you want to upgrade these packages and essentially that's pretty much it that's how you update your system and now that we've done that let me go down and show you guys the software center uh, and this will allow you to install applications. I believe I showed a little bit earlier, but I didn't go through and install anything. So let's go down and install something here. So you can see that the sudo command works pretty much the exact same way. So let's install GIMP, which is an image manipulation program. And essentially all you have to do is click on it. And then there's a button that says install. And one cool thing about this package manager right here it, it has reviews of the packages uh, from everyone that's using it and, you know, information about the actual package that you're installing. And all you have to do is hit install. And this is basically running it as sudo because it has to authenticate. 
It's the exact same thing as if you were running it within the command line. So let's press authenticate and then it will go through the process of installing the packages package. And at the end of the day, this is doing exactly what you can do within the terminal. And within my first couple of years of learning Linux, I forced myself to not use the package manager. I forced myself to install things from the command line. And I recommend you do the same. That way you can get the hang of actually updating, installing packages from the command line, because that's the best way to actually do it. But let's go down and wait for this thing to finish. This is kind of a, a pretty decent sized uh, program, so it'll take a little while to actually install. But as you can see, it's almost there. It's right at 90%. So let's wait a couple more minutes. But I just wanted to show you guys that that's the full process of opening, installing an application. And that's pretty much it. And if you ever want to remove an application, all you got to do is hit remove. So let's go down and close this. I'm not going to open up the package that I installed. But before we move on, I wanted to show you a couple more things you could do with the app package manager right fast. I figured that would be better for you to understand the actual program. But if we type sudo and then apt, and let's say we want to search for a package uh, and you got to kind of know the names, but all you got to do is type sudo apt search and then the package name. Let's look for that same package that we just installed. So uh, search GIMP and it'll search the repository for the GIMP package man or the GIMP package that we just installed. Now it doesn't narrow it down too much because a lot of these package have GIMP in it. But uh, if you scroll through here, you'll see the actual package. And maybe that was a tough one to actually look for. So let's go back down to the bottom and search for something else. And let's uh, press the up arrow and let's search for a zip program. And we all know zip from Windows, how you compress files and folders. You can use the zip package where there is a ported version of zip on the Linux operating system that you can use to zip and unzip files. So let's go down and search for that and see if it's there. And as you can see, I believe it's a zip tool or a zip, not zip tool, but it should be. Yeah, here we go. Zip. It's uh that is the actual package. So archiver for zip files. So that's a way to search for applications. So let's say we want to install that application, the package name is what's in green at least on the linux operating system and like i said other distributions use different package managers so different commands to actually search for packages but let's say we want to install zip let's go down and install it right fast and the command to install it and let me move my mouse out the way but it's sudo apt install and then zip and you can press enter and that'll install the zip package. And as you can see, zip is already installed. It already already has the latest version. That's why it didn't do anything because zip is already installed. So let's try unzip because I'm, sometimes unzip is not on here. Let's try that and see if it goes through. Now nah, unzip is on there as well. So anyway, that's pretty much how you install a package. Now, let's say you want to remove a package. And one thing we can remove is the unzip package. And all you have to do is type sudo apps and the command to remove it is simply remove. So remove and then unzip or actually let's uh, remove the GIMP package and just press enter and it'll go through and remove GIMP. And I believe I might have installed a snap package, so that may not work. So it wasn't installed through app through the package manager. Sometimes it'll default to the snap version. And I know I didn't explain that, guys, but a snap is essentially a containerized piece of software that you can install. It's, they call it a snap package. It's a new thing that they're pushing to manage packages but app is still relevant and it's something you need to learn in order to use the op Linux operating system. So let's try removing unzip All right fast and we can un remove that actual application should be good to go. So unzip is going to be removed and then we'll just install it back on the system. But that re fully removed unzip from the system. Now let's go on and install it back on the system by just running 
uh, sudo apt install unzip so you can see you know something actually being installed and that's pretty much it so you can use the zip and unzip package on this system and that's pretty much how you use the package manager on a Linux operating system and this mainly will work for Debian based distributions if you're using a different distribution then you'll have to refer to the package managers documentation for that distribution of Linux. Okay, so in this segment, I'll cover a couple text editors, and this is very beneficial to understand so you can make changes within the Linux operating system. And I'm talking about like configuration files for various applications within the operating system that you'll occasionally have to do like when you install certain applications, for example, an Apache server, then there are configuration files that you have to modify in order to get Apache up and running the proper way. And so it's beneficial, it's very beneficial to understand how to use a text editor. So I'm going to show you two of the major ones that I recommend you guys start learning in order to get proficient with editing within the terminal. Because if we look around the desktop, we can easily look around the desktop and there is what they call a text, uh, like I forget it's called text editor. Yeah. And most Linux distributions, if it has a desktop environment, it'll come with a text editor. It could be like mouse pad or something like that. And you can easily make changes in here, but it's better to understand how to use it from the command line. So I wanted to cover it right fast. Uh, so you guys can get a better understanding of it. So first one I want to show you guys is Nano. And Nano is the easiest and simplest one to actually use. So let me go down and show you guys how to get started using Nano. And the first thing I want to do is open up the man page for it so you guys can at least see the information about the actual program. And if we check it out, you know what I'm saying? The manual has a lot of good information that can help you understand how to actually use it. Now, let's go down and find a file in order for us to edit. So let's go CD. Um, and I know under Documents and Ansible. And I think it's, um, I think we have, uh, let's see, a couple of files in here we can edit. So LAMP, uh, simple. Let's go into there and press Enter. And then let's ls this directory right fast. And there are, let's try that host file right fast. So uh, actually let's cat it out right fast because I want to see how long it is, which it really doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be too long. Yeah, that's a good enough file size. So let's edit that file. So let me clear right fast. And the easiest way to use nano is just simply type in nano and then the actual file name, which was host host and press enter there we go so let's could just go down to the bottom i just kind of want to show you guys you could just easily edit this thing simply like this so let's type uh ubuntu and then let's just type 20.04 uh lts but that's simply how you use the text editor now let's cover some of the menu options now it, let's say you needed help uh, while you're actually using this, uh, you could just with the up arrow right there on each one of these, that's basically the control button. So control G. So let's hit control G and that'll open up our help. So as you can see, that's the help right there. You can go through it. You know what I'm saying? It kind of explains a little more, uh, and explains those commands down at the bottom. Uh, now we can, uh, just press Q and that'll get us back to the actual file itself but just to cover some more of these options you got exit right believe right below it uh you got control o which is writing out the changes so let's like for instance let's use that now we made changes by adding this ubuntu 20.04 lts so we can do control o and that'll write out our changes to that file name it's basically going to ask us are we sure we want to write it to that file uh and that name or we could change the format or we could change the file name if we wanted to like make a copy of it. But let's save it as that file. So that's cool. It says right wrote nine lines and it basically overwrote that file. And then we have read. So that's uh, control or 
uh, control W is where is. And that's beneficial if you're, let's say, looking for something in a big, long file or a configuration file. That's basically your search. And then the control backslash, that's actually a find replace. Then you got control K. So let's say we want to cut this whole line. All you got to do is be at the front of the line and hit control K. And that'll cut that actual line. Now let's say we want to paste whatever we just cut. Uh, we can uh, just do control U and that'll paste whatever you had there uh, or whatever you recently cut. So super cool that that's actually there cut paste you know what i'm saying uh then you got your control j for justify uh control t to spell and then control c cursor precision and then control underscore go to specific line and one thing that's beneficial for let's say you're a programmer or something a lot of times when you're programming an application or a script or something uh it'll throw an error and it'll tell you what line the error is on so it's beneficial to use that if you're looking for a specific line within the file that was thrown from the error while you was building whatever script or application that you were working on, especially if the file has like a thousand or something lines, you know, within it. It's very beneficial. Now, that's pretty much the high level overview of the nano text editor. So let's go down and exit out of it. And just to show you how to exit it, you could just hit uh, control and then X, and then we did make some more changes to it. So it's basically asking you if you wanna save those changes. So all we have to do is type Y for yes, and then it's gonna ask us if we wanna write it on to that same file name, press enter, and that'll actually save out that file. And we can cat it out right fast, right fast by typing uh, cat host, press enter, and it'll cat out that file. We can see that those changes have been saved to that file. Now, the next te text editor I want to show you guys is Vim. Now, Vim doesn't come on Ubuntu by default. You have to install it. So all you have to do is type uh, sudo apps install Vim, and that will install it on your operating system. And let's go on and run it again. Uh, even though I already have it installed on here, uh, I just want to run it so you guys can follow along and see how to install the Vim text editor. But Vim is based on VI or V, I, I believe VI came first and then Vim, it, it's just basically VI on steroids. It has a lot of features. Uh, you can set key bindings and all kind of stuff uh, using the Vim text editor. And a lot of people rant and rave how great Vim is. But I'm one of these people that like to, I don't know, just get things done. It doesn't matter how it gets done. So. A lot of times I'll use Nano, but I do understand how to use Vim and I see the power in using Vim. So shout out to all you Vim users out there. Um, I definitely like the program, but let's go down and give you a simple usage of the Vim application. And let's clear right fast and let's go down and open up a file using Vim. So I'm just open up this readme.md file. There we go. And as you can see, the navigation is pretty much the same as Nano, but the problem or the thing that kind of kind of messes people up when they're first learning, you have to use commands in order to do certain things. Like, for instance, you can't just type right now into the actual uh, program, you know what I'm saying, into the text file. You have to put it in what they call insert mode. And the way you get into insert mode is just simply by typing I, and then you'll see down at the bottom, insert mode so let's go down and add some changes to here so let's type ubuntu uh, 20.04 and then lts boom so in order to get out of insert mode all we could do all we need to do is just hit exit and that will take us out of insert mode and we can go back to just navigating the file or whatever but now this is basically stored in memory you know what I'm saying? Whenever you open up an application, you make changes to something, it's kind of stored in memory. It hasn't been written out to the actual file. And that's similar to the nano text editor as well. Whenever you make changes to the file, it's, it's basically changed in memory. And then until you actually quit the application or save the actual changes, then it's actually just in memory. And there are commands in order to save things in 
them and so i wanted to show you guys some of them right fast so in order to let's say we want to write out those changes that we made um in order to do that all you have to do is hit the escape button and then type colon and then w and that'll write out the actual changes so let's press enter and as you can see we made those changes uh it tells you at the bottom right there written out so those changes we made or in the actual file now let's verify that we actually save those changes by let me showing you guys how to quit it so all you have to do is type colon and then q and press enter and i'll actually quit the file and then let's just cut out that file right fast to read me that way we can see that those changes are there and if we and if we look right here uh you'll see the ubuntu 20.04 that we made changes to you know the file those changes were saved so let's go down and open it up again uh in vim and let's say we want to make those changes or change uh let's say we want to remove that lts off the end of it so let's go insert mode uh and then we could delete that text out of there now let me show you how to actually quit it instead of just writing the changes out let me show you how to quit it and save it at the same exact time so all we have to do is type escape and that'll get us out of insert mode and then we just type colon and then write and q so w and q and that'll write changes and then quit the actual file so let's press enter and we can cat it out again just so you guys can see but if you look up here uh, the LTS is gone. So that's basically how you make changes to the actual file. You just go into insert mode and then you can write out those changes or you can quit and save those changes. And then let's go back into it right fast. And I just want to show you guys how to quit it without making changes. Uh, and simply you can go back into insert mode right there. And let's say we want to type LTS and then let's say this is a very long file and we start going through it and we don't remember what all the changes or the changes that we made within this file so let's say uh, we don't want to save any changes that we actually made to this file so all we have to do is type colon or actually get out of insert mode first then hit control I mean then hit colon and Q and then bang or the exclamation point and press enter and I'll actually exit out without saving those changes. And we can cut it out again just to make sure. Uh, but the changes that we did make, uh, they're not, they weren't saved to the actual file. So good to go. Now, like I said, I just wanted to give you guys the basics. I could go like very deep into this actual command or into this actual text editor, as well as nano. I mean, nano is, you know awesome as well it's pretty basic but vim you know you can go super far with it but most people had issues with saving and exiting the actual program there is a meme that goes around a lot of times with a joke on it basically saying how do i exit vim you know what i'm saying <laughs> and it's kind of funny or whatever but hopefully this guys gets you started with working with with text files within the terminal using a text editor So this concludes my introduction to Linux course. I hope you learned at least the basics of using the Linux operating system, because I think this will motivate you to want to learn more. And throughout my years of working in the IT field, I have always heard people say that learning Linux is too confusing. And I hope this course dis dispels that myth. So make sure you keep practicing me because the way to become a guru is to keep using Linux. So I hope you have a good day and keep it techie.